What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen and I am here with another true crime case. So today we're going to be speaking about the unsolved disappearance of Monica and Michael Bennett, two siblings from all the way back in 1989 in Brunswick, Georgia. This one is a very complicated one between family dynamics, the fact that they both were labeled as runaways for an incredibly long time. There was a lack of a police investigation. You guys already know what kind of results you'll get from that kind of recipe in a true crime case. It all led to a very jumbled story, bits and pieces of information that were coming out slowly over the course of a handful of decades. Some of the information is a little bit contradictory and there's no explanation for it. There is no police statements that I've been able to find on this without getting an FOIA. Um, so I am incredibly thankful for the Fall Line podcast. I believe I believe it was back in 2017, they managed to sit down with Michael and Monica's family, at least a few of the family members, and they were able to get as much information possible from them to try to piece together the events of before, during, and after Michael and Monica's disappearance. We want to state really quickly that there are no public police sources directly stating Michael and Monica's parents' and step-parents' names. So because of that, I am going to be using pseudonyms in their place. This is also a great time to give you guys a quick reminder. If I purposely do not state someone's name in a video, it is for my protection and theirs. Understand that a lot of these videos, a lot of these stories that I tell can make you very frustrated um, or angry, but when you name drop below, whether you think that's going to be helpful or not, that opens up the opportunity for someone to take legal actions against you. It opens up the opportunity for someone to take legal actions against me, and it can potentially put the person that you are name dropping in a lot of danger. So please make sure that you stay responsible, stay respectful, not just on my channel, but whenever you you are consuming any type of true crime content, you're not benefiting anyone by throwing someone's name out there when true crime creators have tried really hard to protect someone's identity. It's for a reason. So before I get into the details of today's case, I need to first say a huge thank you to NordVPN for partnering with me on today's video. If you aren't aware of what NordVPN is, first of all, you do not watch enough of my videos, but second of all, it is a virtual private network that helps to protect your personal information while you are browsing the web. If if you're browsing using public Wi-Fi, or even if you're browsing in what you think is the safety and comfort of your own home, there is a chance that someone can get into all of your personal information if it's not properly protected. So basically a VPN goes in and creates a tunnel full of rainbows for you. So all of your personal data and information can go right through it, this beautiful encrypted tunnel, so nobody can get their hands on it. This means everything from your passwords, your credit card information, browser history, you name it. I know a lot of us are guilty of keeping so many things on our devices, all of it will be protected. You can have up to six simultaneous connections going on all at once. So if you're someone who has like a phone and a laptop and then a work phone, things like that, they all can be connected. There's also over 5,400 servers in 60 different countries. So you don't have to worry about your connection slowing down, which was one thing that I was worried about and it has not made any difference whatsoever. It's also very user-friendly, which is something I was very thankful for. I am not an incredibly tech-savvy person, which is ironic because I have a YouTube channel, but there is an app that you can get on your phone and there's also a browser extension. You click one button to turn the VPN on and it's that easy. Right now you can get an exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash Danielle. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. It's definitely worth it in my opinion. We take safety so seriously on this channel and that includes internet safety. So make sure to go check out NordVPN today. Thank you again to NordVPN for making it possible for me to create these videos to support these victims and their families as much as I possibly can. So now onto the details of the case. Monica and Michael both vanished on June 21st, 1989. I don't have a time really to give you. The times online are all over the place. And there's also not much that's known really about either of them. They came from a very, very large family. There were a lot of moving parts going on. Uh, Monica was 15 at the time. I believe she was about to turn 16 and Michael had just turned 14. Monica and Michael share a mother named Mary. So they have the same mother, but they both have different fathers. Now, not much is known about Monica's biological father, but Michael's father, Monica's stepfather, named George, is a key piece in this case as he is one of the last people to have seen either one of them alive and well. 
Mary had a few children, including Monica, from a previous relationship, but I am not sure how many. And then a few years after Monica was born, Mary went on to meet George and they apparently hit it off. However, George was already married. He had a wife, he had other kids of his own, but despite this, Mary and George continued their relationship and along came Michael. Now, initially, George remained with his first wife and kids. He would still see Michael all the time and despite the less than ideal circumstances, his wife welcomed Michael in with open arms. Michael was treated as if he was one of her own, but after a while, George decided to leave his first wife and went on to marry Mary. During their marriage, Mary and George went on to have four more daughters of their own together. As you can see, there was a lot going on, um, a lot of different children involved from different marriages, different relationships. There were the different marriages themselves that were going on. Um, but many of the children did manage to keep in close contact with each other despite these age differences, changes in homes. But you can see how it was very easy for certain things to kind of easily fall through the cracks. Monica was described by her older sister, Sheila, who was Mary's daughter as fun and outgoing. She had a lot of personality to her, but Michael on the other hand was described quite differently. Michael was reserved. This young boy was quiet. He was never one to kind of throw himself into the limelight. He was the guy that sat back, watched everything that was going on around him. He was just this really chill kid. But other than this, I don't know much about either of these kids. But one thing that I do know for sure is that their life was far from simple. According to Mary's mother and the kid's grandmother, Mary and George had a complicated relationship. To her, it seemed that George was very manipulative. She said that he wanted to control every aspect of their life that he could. At times, she said he could even be aggressive. And many times throughout their marriage, Mary would decide to up and leave George, but she wouldn't leave taking the children with her. She would leave and go off on her own and leave all of the children back with George. However, this happened on a regular basis and every single time Mary always came back. But the depth of the issues behind the scenes is absolutely heartbreaking. Monica remained very close to her sister, Sheila. Sheila at the time was a senior in high school. She had already married someone and they were expecting their first child at the time. And because of that, she had moved out of the family home and in with her in-laws to be with her husband. But she still attended Glen Academy, which is where Monica went. And that was really where they were able to maintain their connection. They were able to keep in touch, check in on each other. And one day prior to Monica's disappearance, Monica came to Sheila in distress. She confided in her that George had been making sexual advances on her and she was scared to go home. Obviously, Sheila hearing this information, she took Monica to the guidance counselor at Glen Academy and they both explained what was going on and Monica's fear of going home. From there, they were taken to the local police department where Monica informed police of her allegations against her stepfather, George. And then at that point, Monica was taken back home. Police met Mary and spoke with her, likely to let her know about these allegations and listen to her concerns about it, see how they want to proceed. But unfortunately, Mary seemingly dismissed them. Mary told police that Monica was likely just making all of this up, that this was some plan that she had to get out of the house because she wanted to be with her boyfriend. And with that simple explanation that this was all just a lie for Monica to go hang out with her boyfriend more, Monica's accusations were entirely dismissed. Police left, they never spoke to George from my understanding, and Monica was left feeling defeated and in a home that she had been fearful to come back to. But Sheila wasn't the only one that Monica had confided in, and Sheila was still standing beside her sister believing these accusations. Monica shared a room with one of her other sisters, and she informed her sister that George had been coming in at night attempting to get Monica to get up out of bed and go somewhere with him, and this made her incredibly uncomfortable to the point where she made her sister switch sides of the bed with her, putting her against the safety of the wall and making her harder to reach. Hearing Monica's accusations and wanting to be able to back them up and help her any way she could, Monica's sister told her, you know what, wake me up the next time George comes in here so I can see for myself 
himself what he's doing. Now, they did attempt this plan, but apparently Monica's sister would not wake up. They decided to curate another one. Monica's sister had a tin dollhouse, and so they planned to put it up against the door one night. That way, if George tried to come in, they would hear him hit it. If he tripped over it or something, it would make a lot of noise, and this hopefully would wake both of them up. And this plan ended up working exactly as they had hoped. Now we have Sheila, who has heard these accusations and tried to help Monica. And then we also have another one of Monica's sisters who has you know, seen George try to come into their bedroom to get Monica, but there was still one person that didn't believe Monica's claims apart from her own mother, and that was Michael. At the time, Michael was very close to his father, George, and he didn't believe that this was something at all George was capable of doing until Michael himself ended up walking in to one of these attempts on his own. Allegedly, Michael went to his mother about what he saw. He went to Mary and said, look, I am going to confirm that Monica's not lying about this. At this point, she couldn't really ignore what was being said. She didn't just have one daughter making these claims anymore, another one trying to back it, but she now has two other children that have personally seen and caught George in the act. So at this point, she decided to get a divorce. She separated from George. After the separation, Mary went on to, I believe, move in with a friend and George went on to get his own apartment in the Heritage Apartment Complex. And they're not apartments in the sense that you likely are thinking right now. They're more of just a group of townhouses. It's honestly not very clear what happened to all of the children at this point. I do know that Michael decided to entirely remove himself from the situation. He moved back in with George's first wife. He still welcomed him back in in a safe home with open arms. So that is where he moved to. Monica, on the other hand, moved in with her biological father, the one where we just really don't know much about him. But according to her siblings, this isn't something that she would have chosen unless it was the only option that she had. I believe that Mary and George's four children who were younger at the time did primarily stay with Mary. And I know that some weekends they would in fact go and visit their father and stay with him at the Heritage Apartment Complex. But as you can see, everyone's kind of scattered around. There's lots of tension going on. Um, and that's pretty much all that is known. Now, from the time that these accusations began and Michael and Monica moved out, neither of them continued any contact with George from what anyone has stated in any interview. So you can see how it was very strange to everyone when George suddenly showed up to each of their houses to pick them up the day of June 21st, 1989. George first showed up at his ex-wife's home to get Michael. Despite Michael living there at the time, she did not have any legal rights to him. She was not a guardian of Michael. So if George or Mary wanted to come to her house and take George back, they had the right to, and there wasn't much she could do to fight them. But according to what family has heard, Michael was devastated when George came to get him. He was crying. He made it very clear that he did not want to leave with George, but George took him anyway. From there, they went to go and pick up Monica, who was living with her biological father. Monica, however, did not have any reason to go with George. He had no guardianship over her, but again, from what family has stated, she was home alone that day. So it's not like her father was there to really stop anything. It is theorized that maybe she agreed to get in the car because Michael was there, or maybe she could have been forced or coerced to get into the vehicle. No one really knows, but it just seemed odd that Monica would willingly leave with George after the things that she accused him of and after she had finally freed herself of him. Now, according to family, the reasoning that was given by George as to why he picked up Michael and Monica was because he said he needed their help to pack up the rest of his apartment before his move. But from that point, no one really has any idea what they actually did that day until they were last seen by someone other than George later that evening. Michael and Monica's maternal aunt just so happened to live in the exact same apartment complex as George and she lived on the opposite side of the apartment complex. At some point that night, she got an unexpected knock on the door, and it was Monica and Michael, and they were alone. Now, she knew that George's kids would frequently come over and stay with him on the weekends. They would play around in the open field that was in the middle of the apartment complex, so she would see them. It wasn't odd to her at all that Monica and Michael would be with him. She did know that 
George and Mary had separated, but no one knew why at this point. Monica and Michael were obviously invited in. They all sat around and spoke for a while. Um, their aunt had actually just finished up feeding her own family. And so she offered them each a plate of food for dinner. And she stated that when she did this, Monica and Michael kind of exchanged glances, almost as if they were trying to decide, you know, is it okay to stay longer? Should we not? Um, should we go home and leave? And it just seemed odd, but ultimately they both ended up taking a plate of food. Now their aunt said that during this entire visit, it seemed to her as if Monica and Michael had something they wanted to say. There was something on their mind and they were just hesitant or nervous to come out with it. So as they got up to leave between eight and 8.30, she offered to walk them out. Now at the time, it's the end of June, it's summertime, the sun was still out according to their aunt, but it was just starting to set and three of them headed off. And she hoped kind of in the safety of walking just the three of them down the sidewalk that they would finally say what she thought they wanted to, but they never did or they never got the chance because up walked George. As they were all standing there together, George began to plead with the kid's aunt to call Mary for him. He wanted her to try to convince her sister to come back home. And as he's pleading with her, she finally agrees to walk down to the nearby laundromat where there is a payphone to make the call for him. So from the way it's been explained, all four of them walk towards this payphone. She remembered calling Mary and basically just regurgitating exactly what George had told her to say. And she ended up speaking to her for less than a minute before handing the phone over to George. At this point, she noticed both Michael and Monica had headed off on foot, the two of them, back towards the apartment complex. And to her, it seemed like they were heading back to George's apartment. She watched them go up and over a hill and then out of sight. And this was the very last time anyone would see Michael and Monica Bennett. As Monica and Michael disappeared over the hill, George was still on the phone speaking with Mary. So the kid's aunt left him to his conversation and she began to walk home herself. And from here, the story goes even more all over the place. So at some point, both Monica and Michael were reported as runaways by both Mary and George. I have seen that this was done that night, the night of the 21st later on, but I have also seen that it was not done until the 24th, which is days afterwards. And I'm honestly not really sure which is correct. George stated in the initial police report that he had called Mary the night of the 21st at 8.30 p.m. to inform her that he believed the kids had ran away. So right away, you can see that things are not adding up with George's story. First and foremost, if the kids had been reported as missing on the 24th, yet both George and Mary were aware that they were missing as of 8.30 p.m. the night of the 21st, why would they have waited days to call police? Maybe they were waiting for them to return. If they did believe that these two kids were runaways, typically runaways come back. Maybe they assumed the kids went back to their homes. The main issue here is that the call that George seemed to be referring to where he was alerting Mary to the kid's disappearance matches up with the time that he was on the payphone while everyone was there. George, the kid's aunt, and both Michael and Monica. So why would George have told Mary that the kids were missing when they had been right there with him? Now, unfortunately, despite the history that I hope was documented of these sexual abuse allegations that Monica put against George, the parents' claims that, hey, these kids just ran away, we don't know where they were, that was just very easily accepted. If you remember back to when Monica had made these allegations to begin with, her mother basically shut her down and said that the reasoning she was making these allegations was because she wanted to run off with a boyfriend. I don't know if her parents used this as, you know, just another reasoning as to why they believed it's possible the kids ran away. But either way, police ultimately decided that Michael and Monica were runaways. So that is how their case was classified for over a decade. Now, from this point on, no one really has any clue what police have done to investigate. Usually runaways show up within a matter of days, weeks, if you're really pushing it, especially at this age. We're only 15 and 14 years old. Michael and Monica had no money of their own. They had no transportation of their own. They had absolutely no way of supporting themselves. Michael was also incredibly close to his family. George's ex-wife was like a mother to him and he was very close to his other siblings there. It didn't make sense for him to want to run away, especially because he was such a shy and reserved kid. He really liked being comfortable 
cool. He wasn't one to rock the boat. Um, it just seemed out of character for him to run away. Monica, on the other hand, some believed it was very possible she ran away, including her own family. Accusations that she made against George, they had been completely ignored by someone that was supposed to protect her. She was also staying with her biological father at the time, which I don't know much about that, but from what her family has said, that is not an ideal situation for her either. She's also the spunky, outgoing, independent of the two. So if she had made up her mind that she wanted to run off for something better, her family could absolutely see her doing that. But at the same time, the main issues that everyone knew of that Monica was having, dealing with her stepfather, dealing with George, that had been dealt with. And so no one could really understand why she would want to run away at that point. Why would she have agreed to leave with George that day? Why did George even need help from Monica and Michael, two of his kids that he wasn't speaking to when his four girls were actually coming to stay with him that weekend and they could have helped him pack up? There were just so many questions that were left unanswered. According to what the family has stated, there was no official organized search ever. Typical procedures for runaways are to sit back and wait for them to run out of resources or get upset and come back home. Um, no family was ever questioned, at least not for over a decade, including their aunt, who was one of the last people to see them. So at this point, it is frustrating that the police department was not treating their case as anything other than a runaway, but, you know, their parents themselves are saying, oh yeah, these two kids ran away. You know, we don't know what happened. George was claiming to be the last one to be with them. No one knew the aunt had seen them at this point. Half the family didn't even know that the kids were missing. So to police, this really did kind of make sense. However, there were a lot of questionable things that were happening in the background. Just days after Michael and Monica went missing or ran away, whatever may have happened, not just George, but George, Mary, and their four children hopped on a bus and moved all the way to Alabama. If runaways are known for coming back, where were Michael and Monica supposed to come back to? Most families that experience a missing loved one, they don't change their phone number, they won't change their address, um, they won't change a thing because they are hoping that their loved one is going to come back to them. They want to still be where they were when their loved one disappeared. Obviously, that's not the case for everyone. It's not a one size fits all type of situation. We all react differently. We all behave differently. So yeah, some decide they cannot be where they lived before. They cannot keep the same number. They have to move forward. But within a few days, that kind of seemed strange. This is where the stories of those in the family piece together more of what happened the day of the disappearance, the time after, and even moments in the distant past that may help explain what might have happened to Monica and Michael Bennett. George, after the disappearance, allegedly told multiple different stories about what happened when Michael and Monica vanished. One story that George was telling people was that Monica and Michael had run out of the apartment just out of nowhere, both of them just up and took off running and he couldn't locate them afterwards. This story suggests that after this phone call where he also allegedly told Mary that the children were already missing, that they all ended up back together at the apartment complex and from there, both Michael and Monica ran off. Another claim was that he had actually dropped the kids off earlier that evening, leaving them to pack as he ran a handful of errands, only to return to them gone. But that also doesn't really make any sense because the kids had walked themselves home after the phone call where they were seen by both George and their aunt, so he wouldn't have been able to drop them off there. This indicates this all happened much earlier. And then in his final story that I know of, he claimed that they actually didn't vanish from his apartment at all. George stated that he took both Michael and Monica to drop them off at Mary's house and that he had no idea what happened to them after. But this also doesn't really make a lot of sense. Neither Michael or Monica lived with Mary. I don't know how frequently they visited her, so maybe that could explain it. But if he were taking them anywhere, I would expect him to take them back to his ex-wife's house and Monica's biological father's. And Mary has never come forward from my knowledge to confirm that either of them were dropped off at her home and also, according to other stories that we find out down 
the line, the other four children that Mary and George had together were at Mary's home at the time. So they would have seen both Michael and Monica and not a single one of them from my knowledge has stated that they did. So at this point, the only solid information that we have is that the aunt saw them walk up and over the hill. But other than that, George has multiple different versions of how exactly the two vanished that night. Many other rumors started to swirl around at the time and a lot of Monica and Michael's family members have stated in interviews that they believe a lot of these came from George's circle of friends. It possibly stemmed from him. Rumors that Monica had a boyfriend that was heavily involved in drugs and that somehow this played a part in their disappearance. But this also didn't really make any sense. According to Monica and Michael's family, Monica did have a boyfriend at the time, but they stated that they did not believe he was a drug dealer. They just didn't see him as being some high roller teenage drug dealer that, you know, someone would have put a hit out on and not even on him, but on his teenage girlfriend. And on top of that, why would someone have gone looking for Monica at these apartments? This is not somewhere that she had ever lived. George was not her biological father. She had not lived with him in a long time. And that would mean that someone that came to look for Monica also decided to take out another young teenager that was there at the time. It just seems like, it just seems very unrealistic and not a likely possibility. According to Michael and Monica's aunt, she has said that she had a very good reason that day for believing that Monica and Michael had something they wanted to say to her. She knew the feeling all too well of having something weighing heavy on her heart and mind, and this is why she was so concerned. When their aunt was only 13 years old, George had made sexual advances on her as well. And Mary, the kid's mother and her sister actually walked in on it. So we now have a long history of George making these sexual advances on young children. She tells the story in her own words on the Fall Line podcast. I will absolutely not be telling her story for her out of respect. So if that is something that you're interested in hearing, I recommend you go and listen to the Fall Line podcast. Just like everything else, this was something that just wasn't spoken of again after it happened. She did in fact tell their mom she was worried because she felt that based on the way Mary looked at her when Mary walked in, that Mary blamed her for what was going on. She was also upset because she had looked up to George a lot up until this point. And she was also kind of worried that Mary knew George was like this, that, you know, she knew George would possibly make sexual advances on a young child. But ultimately she ended up begging her mom not to say anything. She did not want to cause any issues. She didn't want to ruffle any feathers. She did eventually go on to tell her husband, um, but still years later, it's just something that she does not want to talk about understandably. She was incredibly brave in telling her story in the Fall Line podcast to show why she had so many concerns. According to Michael and Monica's younger sisters, a few of them that have at least come forward and spoken, a few bits and pieces of information came out over, you know, the past couple of decades that made things that much more suspicious. According to them, George showed up to Mary's house late that night of the 21st to pick them up and take them back to his apartment. So we do have confirmation that George did in fact go to Mary's that night, but it doesn't seem that he went there to drop Monica or Michael off. They said that after George picked them up, he started to do slow circles driving around the streets around the apartment complex. And to them, it seemed like he was looking for something. I don't know if at the time they knew that their siblings were missing. Um, so they didn't know what he was looking for based on what their interviews have said. They just knew that he was looking for something, but looking back on it and knowing that at the time, Michael and Monica had vanished likely just hours before. They don't remember him ever specifically searching for them. He didn't roll the window down, call out their names. He didn't stop to speak to anyone at the surrounding, you know, apartments or people walking on the street or at the gas station to see if anyone had seen them. He was just kind of slowly creeping along looking for things. And then when they got back to George's apartment, they said that they noticed two large trash bags sitting beside the door and they asked George directly what the trash bags were. And George told them that those were Michael and Monica's belongings. Longings. I wonder if he was trying to use those two trash bags saying this as an indication that Michael and Monica had packed their stuff up and then decided they were going to run away um, and then for some reason left them behind. Or if he was saying that within hours of both Monica and Michael going missing that he decided to pack all of their personal belongings in trash bags. Either way, 
you can't make that sound good. Michael and Monica had never lived in that apartment with him. And so the girls remember being so confused as to why any of Michael and Monica's belongings would have been there to put in trash bags to begin with. They had previously packed up at a different home and took all of their belongings to where they were staying with George's ex-wife and Monica's biological father. There was nothing there for them or George to pack up and put in these trash bags. Her siblings also stated that they didn't understand looking back why George would have gone to get Michael and Monica to help him pack. As I already mentioned, he clearly had plans to get his girls that night. If he really needed help, they could have helped. Um, but also they claimed that the entire apartment was already packed up and had been packed up. The only thing that was left there to pack were toiletries, things that they needed to use the restroom and like shower, um, small bits of food that they were eating. And then they all still had their beds made so that they could sleep on them. But other than that, there was nothing at all that he would have needed help with. It had already been done. They also noticed once they started kind of dispersing to go into their bedrooms that one of the girls' bedrooms downstairs, the bedding had been entirely stripped from the bed. All of the other beds still had their sheets, still had their comforters, still had their pillows, but this bed had been stripped bare. And there was never any explanation given by George. Why would that one bed be stripped and where did the bedding go? There's all these different stories about the circumstances surrounding Michael and Monica's disappearance that were given by George. And then you have these two trash bags that George claimed were filled with Michael and Monica's belongings when they didn't have any belongings there. This bed that had been entirely stripped. And then to top it off, the youngest children stated that a couple days after Monica and Michael disappeared that George's car did as well. Out of absolutely nowhere, George's car vanished. There was never any explanation as to where it went. So that's why all four of the children and Mary and George ended up moving to Alabama by bus because his car just disappeared. The children also said that they were not aware at all that they were moving to Alabama. They actually didn't know until the day Mary and George packed them up and put them on the bus. So it seemed like a really hasty decision. I don't know if Mary ever told anyone that she was planning on going. Sheila was left behind with absolutely no explanation as to why her mother left. I have no clue what was said to George's other children. And Monica and Michael were still absolutely nowhere to be found. According to Mary's mother, Mary and George's relationship didn't change at all once they moved, not like I would expect it to, but she said that there were still multiple times after moving to Alabama that Mary would leave George. He would still leave all of their children behind with him, but she would always eventually go back and their life just seemed to continue this cycle. After these two teenagers go missing, there's no official search. The police are deeming them as runaways. Their parents that reported them missing just up and leave to another state. And the family members left behind are trying to figure out what on earth is going on and kind of piece together this very confusing situation. And they can only do so much on their own. There was not just speculation around George and the strange things that he said and did prior to and during and then after the children's disappearance, but there was also speculation surrounding George's brother, the kid's uncle. Allegedly, George's brother had spent a lot of time living with George on and off over the years. He also had many sexual assault allegations against him from family members and other young girls alike. And Sheila herself is one of those family members that has allegations against him. So not only were these children being taken care of by a man that had sexual assault allegations against him from his wife's sister and from one of his stepchildren. Um, but we also have his brother who has numerous sexual assault allegations against him as well. And Sheila said at one point, she actually thought he had been charged for something in regards to her sexual assault. And she was under the assumption that he had been put in jail, but she found out years later that he didn't. So there's all these allegations out there, but there are no charges or anything to really back them up so it makes things a little bit more difficult. All of the children said that they remembered growing up, Mary would warn them about George's brother and tell them to stay away from him. And this indicates to me that she knew exactly what George's brother was capable of. 
And unfortunately, Sheila, one of Mary's children, still ended up being sexually assaulted by him. This brings me back to Mary's sister who wondered if Mary was well aware of what George was capable of as well. So it seems that Mary knew both of these men were dangerous, yet they both were still around all of these children and sometimes left alone with them while Mary decided she temporarily wanted to leave George. But the kids also remembered different specific circumstances with George and his brother. So after Monica and Michael's disappearance, the only way they could really describe it was that George and his brother kind of spoke strangely to each other. Um, and one of the kids directly recalls hearing George's brother mention something about a car in the woods. Kind of piqued their interest really quickly because George's car vanished within days of Monica and Michael's disappearance. And according to them, George was like a deer in headlights afterwards, like don't bring this up. And it was swept under the rug and everyone moved past it. This wasn't the only time that George's brother would say something that was somehow connected to Michael and Monica's disappearance. Years and years later, when one of Michael and Monica's siblings, you know, went on to get married, her husband, uh, I believe worked in the same place as George's brother. It was something along those lines. George's brother told him allegedly that George had killed two of his kids. Obviously he comes home and tells Michael and Monica's sister and they are just beside themselves. And they ended up finding out that this is something that George's brother allegedly also told his girlfriend at the time. So if he potentially said this to two people, it kind of makes you wonder how many people out there has George's brother mentioned something to in regards to Monica and Michael's disappearance and what may have happened to them? Obviously, all of this information at this point is with the police, so I'm hoping they are able to somewhat verify these claims. But unfortunately, George's brother is no longer alive. Um, he did move with them to Alabama, but whatever secrets or information he may have known, all of that is now gone. According to some of Michael and Monica's family members, George nor Mary ever really reached out to inquire about the status of their disappearance. Um, they never pushed to have it changed from runaway to missing, like endangered missing or anything like that. But Michael and Monica's siblings grew older and their family really began to talk and people started to slowly connect dots. There were times over those years that some of their family members would get together and their disappearance would come up as a topic of conversation. And almost every single time, little stories and bits and pieces of information would come out that someone knew that no one else did yet. So upon hearing a lot of this new information, Sheila decided that she was gonna go to police herself. I don't believe anyone had gone to speak to police about Michael and Monica's disappearance at this time, um, but knowing the things that she did and those strange pieces of information that I just gave you about the car disappearing and about the house already being packed up and the multiple different stories, it was unsettling. So Sheila went to ask police if they had this information and if not to tell them about it. And at this point, she ended up becoming the point of contact in Michael and Monica's case. And at this point, which I believe was around 2005, Michael and Monica's disappearance was finally changed from runaway to endangered missing. And it's just wild to me in general that their case didn't change sooner than that. As I stated prior, runaways, if they are going to come back, it usually happens within a few days or a few weeks. And we've seen this before where, you know, individuals are believed to be runaways. That's how they're classified. But usually a few weeks later, police are like, okay, wait a minute, this isn't making any sense. If they ran away and they're not back yet, something's clearly wrong and it's switched. But you guys, 1989 to 2005, all of that time they were classified as runaways. Police were not interviewing anyone. Police were not searching. All, and all of the evidence and information that may have been out there, people that had since passed away that may have seen something, all of that was lost. At this point, many family members were questioned, but it still wasn't all of them. There were a lot, so I'm sure that had something to do with it. So it did seem like at this point, there was a little bit of movement in the case. I know that Sheila did manage to get the case in the hands of a local college class who had the time to sit down and go through everything and kind of figure out what they could. But as they really started to dig deep into theories and you know really started digging up information, unfortunately, they were approached by police who said that it was now being 
switched back to an active investigation and they had to stop looking into it. Now, this felt like a double-edged sword to Monica and Michael's family. Finally, after years of nothing happening, it seemed like police were actually going to investigate the disappearance of Monica and Michael and try to locate them or at least find out what happened. But also, after missing an entire decade over a decade, it just seemed a little shocking to the family that they would make this college class stop investigating, which to this point, they were the only ones apart from the family that had put any sort of time and effort into figuring out what was going on. And, and at this point, there really wasn't much harm that could have been done. And what they already found could have possibly been beneficial to the police department. So that was a little frustrating, but obviously the class respectfully took a step back. No idea what police went on to do in this active information. I don't know if they tracked down Mary and George to question them to see what their story is now. Not much they could find back at the apartment complex. Clearly, most of those people have likely moved out. I'm sure a ton has changed there. It's not like they can go back and collect potential evidence. It's not like they can go and check where those trash bags had been dumped 15 plus years prior. No one has any idea what they have done. And that's not me saying that they haven't done anything because it's very likely they are just keeping this completely quiet, close to the vest, because there was a lot of time that lapsed. A lot fell through the cracks, and that's even an understatement. So I'm sure that they need to hold tight to whatever they possibly can find to keep the integrity of the case that they're hopefully building. Now, there are a handful of very confusing bits of information out there that I do wish would be clarified by police because that could help in terms of bringing forward tips. Now, according to you know, what George said in the initial police report, obviously according to what his aunt has said, who I am hoping has been questioned at this point, since she was also one of the last individuals to see both Monica and Michael, those children disappeared sometime after 8.30. George said he made the call at 8.30. Both the NamUs and the GBI websites for both Monica and Michael lists the time they were last seen as 5 p.m. on the 21st. But this does not match up with anything. So I don't know if George gave police the version of his stories that he dropped the kids off at the apartment and then he went out to ran, run errands and then came back and they were gone. And so maybe he gave them the time he dropped them off as five and that's why both of those state 5 p.m. when they went missing. Um, but I also feel like they would have questioned the aunt at this point, like I said, and she would be able to confirm that she personally saw them that night, you know, at sunset. I've got absolutely no idea why both GBI and NamUs has the time listed as 5 p.m., especially when figuring out if anyone happened to see them around the time they disappeared is so crucial to potentially finding out what happened to them. Um, I just feel like maybe a little bit of clarification there could be beneficial. Finally, in 2009, Monica and Michael had their names entered into missing person databases 20 years after their disappearance. At this point, it's honestly better late than never. So I feel like at this point, this case is most likely going to be solved through some sort of confession or potentially more witnesses coming forward, having seen or heard something. But we're also talking about something that happened so, so long ago. So it's about raising awareness, raising exposure, talking about this story, getting it to circulate in that community again and surrounding communities in Georgia because no one at the time would have known Michael and Monica were missing. They wouldn't have known for over a decade that something that they may have seen could potentially relate to a missing persons case. So raising exposure now is going to be the best way you could possibly benefit this case. Did anyone see Monica and Michael get back to George's apartment successfully? Did anyone see Michael and Monica with George that night after sunset? Did anyone at the laundromat happen to see where George went after he got off the phone with Mary? There are many theories as to what happened to Michael and Monica. There is, I guess, a slight chance that Michael and Monica ran away, but I don't think Think it's the most likely one. Their social security numbers have not popped up anywhere. They have not popped up anywhere. Um, Sheila strongly feels that Monica would have come to her or someone in the family if she had these plans of running off. I guess there's also a very small possibility that they did both run away and coincidentally they became uh, you know, victims of circumstance. They both somehow met with foul play directly afterwards, but that seems like an absolutely massive stretch. Or maybe they did run away and then there was some sort of accident somehow in a location where nobody ever found them. I mean, those are obviously theories that can't immediately be ruled out and there's nothing else to go off of, but they just 
the likeliness just isn't very high. Police do believe at this point that foul play is involved in Michael and Monica's disappearance. Their grandmother did state in an interview that she wants so badly to believe that they are alive, but it's just there's nothing really supporting that after 30 years going by. Unfortunately, this then leads to having to speculate on what may have happened to them and where Michael and Monica could have ended up. And the biggest thing I noticed when looking at Google Maps is that there are quite a few bodies of water surrounding the last location that they were seen, including the ocean. The Black River was the first large body of water. It's just a little over a five minute drive away from the Heritage Apartment Complex. It's a pretty large river. And then after that, there's just endless marshlands leading to the coast. And it is unfortunately a perfect setup for disposal of a body. I just really hope that one day this case is solved. It's honestly unbelievable looking back at how things were investigated and done in that time period you know, compared to what is done now and how easily it seems that things were just accepted or dismissed or fell through the cracks. So I'm honestly very optimistic that police are looking into it now with different technology to be used and hopefully a fresh perspective on things and they may be able to find things that they would not have years prior had it been investigated. Despite the fact that police have not really openly shared anything with the public, it does seem that they are looking into the case. And I know that Michael and Monica's family has absolutely no intention of quitting their efforts to search for them. If you are from Georgia or the surrounding areas, please, please, I'm begging you to share this story with anyone you possibly can. Exposure is absolutely everything for a case that is this old with this little information to it. Whether you share the Fall Line podcast, which I believe is from their first, no, their second season, and I believe it's also about three episodes long, um, or you share my video, share their missing persons posters. There's also the most recent age progressions that you can share along with their story to share wherever you possibly can so that hopefully someone manages to remember something that can help in this investigation. As always, if you have any information at all in regards to the disappearance of Monica and Michael Bennett, all of the contact information you could ever need to get that in the right hands is listed down below. From my research, I have not been able to find any way in which you can help the family through a GoFundMe or anything like that. I don't believe there's a Facebook page either, but if there's ever anything like that that is brought to my attention, I will make sure to also link that down below in the description for you guys. We all may not be private investigators or detectives. We all may not have the ability to arrest someone, do DNA testing or all of these other things that will ultimately solve these cases. But the one thing that we can do is share this and raise awareness. And that is what this channel is for. And that is what I hope you guys will do with this case. On that note, I'm gonna go ahead and go, you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to both Michael and Monica's story. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.